Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the webcast 10 Tips for Reducing Workers' Compensation Costs, sponsored by ePay Systems. Before we begin, I would like to remind you that this webcast has been pre-approved for HRCI credit and may also be used for SHRM credit. Please be sure to attend the complete webcast in order to receive your credits. After the webcast, you will receive an email from HR.com, which will include the certification credit information. You may also log into your HR.com profile and go to View My Credits page to find the credits you have received. If you have any questions today for our presenters or for HR.com, please type them in the questions tab on your GoToWebinar control panel and we will follow up with you. Now it is my pleasure to turn the floor over to Michelle. Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar today, 10 Tips for Reducing Workers' Compensation Costs. So glad to have all of you on the phone with us today and to have our presenters. I'd like to just tell you really quick what we're going to cover. So if we can go to the next slide, um, here's the agenda. What we're going to go through is basically introductions. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our presenters that we're thrilled to have with us. Talk to you about some history here, how workers' comp came about, and what you really need to know, um, key things about workers' comp, benefits covered, state laws, things like that. Now, the next topic that we'll cover is something that's near and dear to everyone, and that's costs, direct, indirect costs, and tips for minimizing those costs, as well as transitional duty. And then finally, since our speakers today are experts in the state of Illinois, they're going to talk um, about Illinois' worker comp costs. Now, probably many of you on the, on the line do deal with the state of Illinois, so hopefully you'll find that um, to be very informative. Today, uh, we have speakers from the firm of Nell O'Connor and Daniel Witz. And I'm very happy to uh, talk to you a little bit about their information and, their, and where they've come from. Uh, Brad Nell is the uh, equity principal at the firm and is speaking today with us. He is an expert in workers' comp and civil litigation. He has tried and supervised more than 150 workers' comp cases in the Illinois Workers' Compensation Commission. He also handles insurance fraud, uh, 1B employer's liability, and employment matters of all kinds. He has spoken throughout the nation on workers' comp, and he is a member of the Chicago Bar Association and the Illinois Bar Association and the Illinois Workers' Compensation Trial Attorney Association. So definitely an expert in the area. Also with us today and is also with the firm is Nicole Russo. Uh, Nicole has tried more than 40 cases and, uh, in arbitration, commission, and circuit court levels and has defended a victory decision on appeal in the Second District Appellate Court. She has been honored as an emerging lawyer selected by the Illinois Leading Lawyers in 2017, 16, and 15. And this is uh, quite a distinction awarded to the top 2% of lawyers under 40 years old. Welcome, Brad. Welcome, Nicole. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for having us. You're very welcome. Before I turn it over to Brad and Nicole, let me just tell you a little bit about ePay. If we could go to the next slide. ePay has been around since 2001, and we are a leader in the human capital management space. We're Chicago-based, right, in the heart of the U.S., and we have been developing SaaS-based solutions for our clients in the hard-to-manage hourly workforce environment. Now, not, not only do our clients have employees that are hourly and oftentimes distributed in a lot of places, they, uh, their employees tend to be on-the-go, remote, working in a lot of different locations. And these are employees that are hard to track, hard to manage, hard to pay. But these are the type of solutions that we specialize in and what we've developed. So since the inception we've always, of our company, we've always focused on trying to develop solutions in this area and smarter ways to, to help our clients get the visibility and the tracking of their employees. Now we have a, a full human capital management solution that we offer from applicant tracking to onboarding, HR, payroll, time and labor, uh, benefits management, and performance management. And we serve hourly workforces across the whole U.S. In fact, um, more than 75,000 sites um, are on the ePay system. 
one of the things that is really at the heart of what we do is workforce management. And I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. But we have a very flexible solution that helps us track things like your, your employees at the multiple locations that they may be in, what's happening to them throughout the day, including work incidents. Um, and to do that, obviously, it requires a very good solution, but also someone you can depend on when you have questions. We offer free premium support 24-7 um, around the clock to all of our uh, clients. And that really uh, separates us, I think, from a lot of the pact. And because of that, our clients are very happy, and we boast a 99% customer retention rate. So that's enough about ePay for now. I want to get into the meat of things and uh, turn it over to Brad and Nicole. Actually, I believe Nicole is going to kick it off for us. Yes, ladies first, of course. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nicole Russo at No Connor. I'm going to be starting the webinar by talking about the history of workers' compensation. Um, the states first began enacting workers' compensation laws in 1911, and um, Wisconsin was the first state to draft what was considered a constitutional workers' compensation law, um, something that was able to hold up in court and be deemed um, constitutional. And when we look at the history of workers' compensation, things really started to come into play during the Industrial Revolution. Um, but at that time, the laws were very different than what they look like today. Um, most of, uh, significantly, they were, they were very restrictive back then um, and provided defenses to employers uh, that you don't see in modern laws. And those three defenses, the first one was contributory negligence. And under that defense, the employer wouldn't be li held liable for a worker's injury if it could establish that the worker himself was responsible for his or her own injury. Now, some states do have um, a, a similar defense available, and it's uh, where they have to establish that the, the, the worker was engaged in um, horseplay or something so outside of the scope of their employment that it wouldn't be considered uh, a work injury. But if you look at the history, the contributory negligence defense was much more excuse me, much more broad historically than it is now. Another defense that was available was the fellow servant rule. And essentially what that meant was that if it, an employee's injury was caused by another worker, um, then the employer himself was not responsible. And lastly, there was a theory called an assumption of risk, um, and that protected employers that were engaged in hazardous work. And the mindset was, that if the employee accepted, uh, that the employee was understood to have accepted the hazards of their work when they signed an employment contract. Um, and they were, as part of their employment, they were asked to relinquish their rights to sue their employers for any injuries that came about. Now, you may, some of you may know, but uh, some of you may not, what, what is workers' compensation insurance? Um, and you know, just like any other insurance policy, it's a, a form of protection. So workers' comp is an insurance that provides wage replacement and medical benefits to employees that are injured in the course of their employment. Now, uh, in many states, in, in most of the states actually, in exchange um, for the workers' compensation law protections, the employees do waive their right to sue their employers uh, civilly in court. Um, in Illinois, here specifically, it's called an exclusive remedy, which means that um, the workers' compensation arena is the employee's sole avenue for seeking reimbursement. Um, one thing that's kind of unique to workers' compensation when you're comparing it to, to civil liability is that it does not cover pain and suffering. So over the years, the... Um, Workers' compensation laws have evolved, and most states follow what we now refer to as a no-fault system. Um, and what that means is that the injured worker and the workers' compensation system provide these benefits that I mentioned briefly, which include lost wages, repayment of medical costs, uh, and occupational rehabilitation expenses, regardless of the employee's personal negligence or fault. Um, Illinois, in particular, follows the no-fault system, and there's quite a few other states that do the same. 
Um, and this is different from something like a contributory negligence scenario. It means that um, part of the litigation doesn't have to address primary, or, uh, first off whose, whose fault the injury was. So there's not any litigation about was it the injured worker's fault, was it a co-worker's fault. It's, it's just an assumed no-fault system. So I gave an example here. We have Bob, the janitor, who spills some cleaning solution while he's working and he slips on a, on a puddle injuring his back. Now we know that, that Bob caused the spill and, and the injury was a result of his own carelessness, but under the no-fault system, he still has his workers' compensation rights and can still file a claim for benefits. Moving on to what benefits are covered. Again, these vary somewhat from state to state, but most of the states do offer payment for medical treatment related to the work injury, and that includes stuff such as emergency room treatment, office visits, diagnostic care, surgical costs, post-operative care, physical therapy. Um, almost all states have a, pay, a benefit for lost wages. Um, sometimes those are referred to as different terms, but one of the common terms is called temporary total disability. Um, and what that does is basically it's a wage replacement while the injured worker is recuperating. Another benefit covered under workers' compensation is permanent partial disability. And this is generally what you would consider a, what the injured worker receives as their settlement or their award. This is, this is the money that they're receiving, and it's often based on the individual state's disability schedule. Here in Illinois, each body part is assigned a certain value, uh, and that's where the dollar amounts are calculated from. Another benefit is rehabilitation and vocational retraining, um, and, and that would come into play in an instance where you have uh, a worker who, say, is in a specific trade or is in something very physically demanding and their injury pre prevents them from returning to that um, same position, then workers' compensation does cover training and um, assistance in getting them placed in a new vocation. And the last benefit is death benefits. There are survivor benefits to um, the deceased employee's family. Um, there are some limitations on that. There are uh, state laws that identify who is considered a beneficiary and who can be covered uh, to receive those death benefits. Next question, is coverage mandatory? Um, obviously, you know, with things like auto insurance, you're required to carry it, so are you required to carry workers' compensation insurance? And the, the, the answer is for every single state except Texas, yes. Texas is the only state in the United States that does not require all employers to have workers' compensation coverage. Now, in every other state, the businesses by law are required to pay 100% of the premium for workers' compensation benefits. And that means that you, you cannot, an employer in, in for, the 49 other states cannot require their employees to pay any sort of premium or make any deductions from their paychecks uh, to cover the workers' compensation insurance premium. My next slide is a chart which does a state-by-state -state comparison of the various um, components of workers' compensation laws. So you'll see the map on the top, there's some different colors here. And what those colors mean um, it, are the, the states are broken down by how many minimum employees is the state required to have before it the employer must carry workers' compensation insurance. Um, and so you'll see once again, uh, Texas is up there, Louisiana, there's some states that require the employer to, to have coverage if there are seven or more employees. And then there's other states that are um, a little bit lower. We have California, Alaska, Iowa, Illinois that requires coverage for uh, three or more employees. So that top, I'm sorry, that, that top is the statutory waiting period. Uh, so the colors, the colors differentiate by um, how many employees must you have, and then these numbers are what's called the statutory waiting period. So um, in each state, there's uh, a requirement that the employee miss a certain number of days before work before they are entitled to the benefits. 
So that's where these numbers come in. We have Illinois where the injured worker must be off at least three days before their benefits kick in. And then we have other states like Arizona, Mexico, New Mexico, and Texas where the injured worker must have um, been off for seven days or more before benefits kick in. Now, um, while there are these statutory waiting periods, there's also um, several states that once you hit that seven day or three day or four day mark, the benefits do retroactively apply. So that's where the numbers um, in that upper map are given. And then this middle chart we have um, shows a breakdown by state of how the states compare dollar wise to their maximum weekly benefit. So each state has a maximum allowance um, and what that means is whether the employee was earning $1,000 a week or $10,000 a week, there is a state maximum. Um, so obviously the more the employee will earn, um, that's how, you know, it'll impact you depending on uh, the employee's earning. And so we look, there's states like Iowa and Illinois who are up over the $1,000 mark and you compare that to Mississippi where the state maximum is only $331.06. Um, the bottom chart breaks down what percentage of the injured workers weekly pay they receive while they are temporarily totally disabled. So for the most part these range between 66 and a third percent which is what we have here in Illinois. It looks all the way up to a couple states have uh, a compensation rate of 80 percent of the injured workers rate. Um, so we see Alaska and then it looks like there's some that are even lower than the 66 and a third percent like Massachusetts where it drops down to 60 percent. So for the most part all of the states um, offer weekly benefits to the injured worker between a rate of 60 and 80 percent of their um, pre-injury average weekly wage. Now there's also some differing among the states uh, as far as the duration that the employee can collect. Um, for the most part, it looks like at least half or more of the states don't have a set amount, which means that if the injured employee is off work but still treating and has not reached a state of permanency yet, they can collect indefinitely. Um, there are some states that do put a set number on how long that temporary total disability benefit can be collected. It looks like the lowest on here that I see is Minnesota, which limits the TTD benefits to 104 weeks. Um, and then that third column is permanent partial disability. That's the quote unquote settlement benefit that we talked about. Um, and, and the way that the states calculates that is different as well. As I said, most of them follow a statutory schedule um, and a lot of them do have a maximum benefit rate. It looks like there are a few that either don't address a maximum or don't have a limit. So the big question is why is workers' compensation so costly? And there are several reasons, but we, we, know, we know that a lot of the expense comes from medical bills. And so the question is why is that? Um, and we know that medical services under workers' compensation some states are limited um, by a fee schedule, some are not, but for the most part, the medical services are billed out under a workers' compensation plan at a higher rate than you would see through either a private health insurance, health insurance plan, such as Blue Cross Blue Shield, or a government-funded insurance plan, such as Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, we know in dealing with work comp case that sometimes Medicare will pay uh, a workers' compensation related bill and then seek reimbursement. And when you compare the rates that Medicare pays to workers' compensation, it's often a fraction. Um, so that's one reason that, that medical services are billed at a much higher rate generally through work comp. Another reason is that um, there are many states out there, Illinois included, that have a very low burden of proof for compensability. And what I mean by that is in states like Illinois, um, the employment or the employment injury doesn't have to be the primary cause of the condition um, or the majority cause. It only has to be a cause. 
So um, in states like that, there's a very low burden of proof for an injured worker to say, yes, I had this pre-existing condition, um, but my work made it worse. And, and that's a really low standard, and it, it makes it drives up the workers' compensation clause. As I mentioned, pre-existing conditions in a lot of states are not excluded. Um, the injured worker merely has to establish that the work injury uh, aggravated a pre-existing condition in order for it to be compensable. Um, another factor that drives up the cost is that, at least in the state, um, there is no credit for prior back injuries, although um, there are some pending changes to legislation that have been proposed recently. Um, another issue where we, the employer cannot claim a credit is if an injured worker receives an award or a settlement uh, for what we call a wage loss, which means they are compensated for the fact that post-injury they can no longer earn the same amount. Um, there's nothing to say that after the settlement is reached that an employee can't go be rehired and suffer another wage loss. There's no credit in those situations either. Um, and unfortunately, we also see uh, certain medical providers. I know, at, at least in this state, we often have a problem um, with chiropractic facilities and a lot of clinics that unfortunately will prey on injured workers. Um, and they establish referral sources with uh, attorneys and um, injured workers and unions where they we see a lot of overtreatment um, and inflated case values and charges. And then, so we, as we're talking about costs here, we have what are called direct costs and indirect costs of a worker's compensation injury. So something that would be considered a direct cost is the medical expenses themselves for the injured worker. So this covers, like I mentioned, emergency treatment, office visits, imaging, surgery, therapy. Then we have the what we refer to as TTD, which is compensation for lost time from work. Um, and then we have the permanent partial disability, which is the lump sum award or the trial award that you see at the end of the case, and the vocational retraining if it becomes necessary. So those are, those are the main direct costs. Um, indirect costs, we also have those that once an employee is injured, um, these factors come up and have to be addressed and cost money. So the first thing is an investigation. Obviously it takes resources and time to investigate and interview people, complete reports, um, to check surveillance videos, to see did the, ha did the accident happen as this person claimed it did, uh, Oftentimes, if there's a suspicious injury or claim filed, um, the employer will do a background check to see, uh, can I find some evidence of this worker doing something outside of work that could have caused this injury. Um, in addition to the costs associated with investigation, we have the expense of potentially hiring a new employee, depending on how long that injured worker might be off work, they may need to be replaced if you have a small uh, mom and pop employer, um, they may need to fill that position right away if somebody is expected to be off for a while. Uh, of course, once, you know, just like with an auto claim, once claims are filed, that also can increase the insurance premiums um, depending on the severity of the injury and, and how much may have been paid out on prior claims. Another indirect cost would be safety training, or sometimes, you know, an incident will occur at a workplace that will prompt a new safety practice having to be implemented. Uh, and obviously there are costs associated with retraining and implementing these new policies. So we now have a poll question um, that you guys should be able to see that addresses the cost. And it looks like that's going to be opened up for you guys to uh, submit your answer and your response. And we will, okay, here we go. So the poll is in progress. It's um, asking about your thoughts on how much the workers' compensation 
costs average out, and we'll be addressing those results uh, later on. Now I'm going to move on to our tips for minimizing these costs. Now that we've talked about what the costs are, how can we um, minimize these? So my first tip is documentation. Um, critical component to a worker's compensation injury and investigation of those injuries is to document what happened. Um, we recommend that the investigation is done by a manager or somebody in a supervisory position uh, because a lot of times whatever documentation is created in order for it to be useful in the litigation process. Uh, we need somebody reliable, we need somebody in authority who can be able to testify to the procedure and the documents themselves. So we recommend taking a written statement as soon as possible after the accident. There's various benefits to that. Uh, the first is that generally people's memories tend to be more fresh right after. Uh, another benefit is that oftentimes at that point the injured worker is not yet represented. So he or she may not have been coached yet. He or she may be more candid um, in their information. Uh, and it also gets the injured worker to commit to a story about how this occurred. Um, and it's something that can be compared to and used uh, for impeachment down the road. It can be compared to histories given in medical records. Um, it's something that you can note uh, if we get an attorney involved on the injured worker's behalf at a later date, you can try and piece together how the story may have changed or how the description of injury may have become more specific um, and use that in your defense. Another tip as far as documentation it is more, you know, the, the more thorough the better. And so in a large exposure, a large exposure case, uh, I like to recommend that our clients consider obtaining an independent vendor to conduct their own thorough investigation. And this can include interviewing witnesses, taking written statements from coworkers and supervisors, taking detailed descriptive photographs of the accident, uh, because sometimes when those are, you try to take photographs at a later date, the, the reliability is lost. So it's a good idea to have an investor, an investigator go out right away take photos that document the area in the condition it was in, and you can use that to compare it to the injured worker's testimony at a later date. Um, the, the, the vendor conducting the investigation can also evaluate uh, and give an opinion as to whether they think there is any third-party segregation potential, and what that means is, is there evidence that a third-party uh, a third party's negligent act may have caused the injury, in which case um, the workers' compensation carrier can recoup some of that money. Um, this investigation can also address whether any OSHA reports were completed or any state required reports and obtain copies of those, get copies of police reports. Um, sometimes if there's a serious injury or a motor vehicle accident associated with the injury, uh, we can get copies of those police reports filed uh, for informational purposes. Another tip to minimize costs is to obtain a medical canvas in cases where causation is at issue. Um, and what does that mean? So sometimes we have an injured worker who has a legitimate injury, but there is a question as to whether their condition was related to that injury. Um, we have a lot of vendors that will perform a medical canvas for a flat rate. Um, and what that does is contacts uh, a large scope of medical providers in a geographic area to determine if the claimant has previously treated at this facility. Um, something like that's especially helpful in Illinois where we don't have mandatory disclosure. So in, in our state, at least, uh, an injured worker is not required to notify his employer if he had a prior injury to the same body part or 
treated at another facility. Um, so it's very helpful to kind of do some background digging. Um, in addition to the medical canvas, we ask our clients, is there any cameras in the area where the injured worker was? Um, and this is very helpful, again, to assess credibility and compare the alleged, the, the injured worker's alleged version of the incident with what we actually may have been able to capture on footage. And just to kind of demonstrate this point, I have a very brief video clip. Hopefully this works. And it looks like it's not. All right, that's not working. Um, so what this was, there was a news story recently about this woman who worked in an office um, and she was sitting at her desk and a piece of a sprinkler fell onto her desk and you can see her in the surveillance camera at her office. Look around to see if anybody's around. She picks up the piece and she whacks herself in the head with it. Um, obviously, unfortunately, that happens from time to time and it's one good example of why it's good to do an investigation. The other uh, reason it's important to document is because a description of injury can change as time progresses. Um, like I mentioned, sometimes when an employee gets representation, um, they're counseled on, hey, you know, that version of your accident doesn't sound legitimate. Sometimes a medical provider will um, help shape the history. So the sooner and more detailed documentation and statement you can get, the more helpful it might be. Um, and again, I mentioned secure the statement in writing uh, before family, friends, coworkers, doctors, and attorneys get involved. Another tip we have for reducing costs is to develop a trusted list of IME doctors. In Illinois, we have what's referred to as an independent medical examination. A lot of other states have a comparable mechanism where the employer can uh, require that the injured worker be evaluated by a doctor of their choosing. Um, from a defense attorney perspective, the choice of doctor can be one of the most important parts of the case. Uh, and there are several reasons for that, but one of them specifically is once you choose that doctor, for the most part, you are bound by that opinion for the duration of the claim. The judges and arbitrators don't like to see what is referred to as doctor shopping. Um, if you don't like the opinion and you jump to another doctor, it really uh, impacts the credibility of your defense in a negative way. Um, I mentioned choosing wisely and what I mean by that is um, a lot of carriers will know if I, if I refer a case out to this doctor, I know he's going to write that this is not causally related. Um, and while that may be great uh, it, from a defense perspective, I, I caution that sometimes a, a good report from a bad doctor who has a bad reputation will be of limited value as the litigation process progresses. Um, the arbitrators get to know certain names and certain faces um, and that can impact their credibility assessment if the case does go to trial. Um, another tip is to be aware of the doctor's expertise and credentials when compared to the treating doctor. Um, for instance, if, if the claimant is treating with a neurosurgeon, you, you want to make sure that your expert is at least as qualified as the treating doctor. Um, in, my case, in my cases, I, I try to choose somebody that's even more qualified uh, for credibility purposes. Um, so basically, it's, you know, compare apples to apples at the very least, but always try to get a doctor who is uh, more credible than the treating doctor. And another tip as far as the IME doctor is concerned is to know your doctor, know how well they will hold up during testimony. Again, a, a good report is only as good as, you know, it can hold up. So it, if you get what you want out of a doctor but he may crumble during testimony, it's of limited value. So um, utilize your, your defense and uh, get some feedback and, and create a list of people you know you can rely on.
a lot of states also have preferred provider programs. Um, and what these do is basically provide an employer a network that they can utilize to try and somewhat guide the treatment. Um, for example, in Illinois, we have a preferred provider program that is uh, medical facilities selected by the employer. Um, the employee can choose from a list of these places. Uh, and if they don't want to go to somebody on the employer's list, then that injured worker is now limited to one other medical provider and his or her chain of referrals. Whereas normally, in, at least in Illinois, um, the injured worker can use two doctors and two chains of referral. So it does allow the employer a little bit of control um, by at least coming up with a list of facilities that they're more comfortable with to offer as an option for treatment. Uh, for states that don't have a program like that, we recommend to our large employers to develop relationships with occupational clinics nearby um, that don't have a bad reputation for over-treating, over-medicating. Our next tip is communication. Very important to maintain an open line of communication in every respect to avoid surprises. Um, so. First and foremost, communicate with the injured worker. Um, and I'm, I put in parentheses here, if he or she is not re represented, many states do limit communication with the injured worker directly once they do become represented. Um, but if they're not, or if your state allows it, keep informed about treatment plans, anticipated return to work, possible work accommodations. Um, you know, statistics show that the shorter the period that the person is off work, uh, the smoother the claim will go, and, and the more likely it is that they'll go back to their prior position. So communicate with the injured worker about the expectations. Um, you know, let them know that there's work waiting for them, if possible. Communicate with your carrier and your defense attorney regularly, um, and that's important for the investigation and the documentation that we talked about. Uh, a lot of times, um, in my cases, we are getting them directly from the insurance carrier, but we have uh, close working relationships with the employer themselves, and that sometimes can be where you get uh, the best background information on your case. You get to know about the injured worker. Is there any uh, possible unrelated causes that you may know about? Is there any possible motive uh, on, a, on a disputed case that might have prompted this claim being filed? Like these might be okay. So some of some of my slides, for whatever reason, didn't make it in here. Um, but along the lines of communication, we recommend conducting quarterly or more frequent claim reviews to make sure that everybody is on the same page, um, from defense to the carrier to the employer. We want to make sure everybody is communicating as far as the strategy. Is this a case that you know we absolutely want to take to trial? Um, and just make sure that there's a constant open line and sharing of information. Um, another benefit to keeping open communication is that you can identify potential witnesses early on. You can assess the likelihood of that witness cooperating with you should the case have to go to trial. And um, eliminate or determine if there's any potential for bias by your witness towards the petitioner. Another tip is, uh, has to do with safety incentives. Um, so we recommend make, making your employees accountable for good safety practices. And the question is, how do we do that? So there's a lot of ways. You can incorporate 
safety into the individual employee's performance review. Uh, you can incorporate it into your disciplinary policy. Uh, you can make safety violations uh, part of a probationary period. You can require your employee to sign a safety handbook. Um, so if there's ever any question down the road, well, I didn't know I was supposed to do this, or um, I didn't know what the procedure was, you have a signed statement from that person um, indicating that they did, in fact, have that information. In addition to making them accountable, you can also, on the reverse end, provide incentives for adhering to safety. That can be anything from a monetary bonus, um, a reward. Sorry about that, guys. Um, and you can provide company-sponsored activities to reward safe practices, boost morale, um, keep everybody interested in keeping down costs. Um, another suggestion is to encourage confidentiality among employees regarding plain settlements. Unfortunately, um, that's something that sort of causes a chain reaction if you have an injured worker, especially in a large type setting where uh, people talk. Um, once somebody gets a, a, a settlement, unfortunately, that spreads to other people. So if you can encourage confidentiality, um, that's always helpful in keeping costs down. And the last tip I have, um, I'm going to go into some greater detail because I think it's an important one, is transitional duty. So the first question is, what is transitional duty? Um, and that's temporary work that's offered to the injured employee before he or she has fully recovered from their injury. And so the, the rationale and the mentality is to keep this person active while they are treating. Um, the idea is to get them back to some sort of work and off the couch while they are healing. Um, it should obviously always comply with the injured worker's medical work restrictions, and it should be something that is temporary in nature uh, with the goal to get the employee back to his or her normal job. This is often referred to as light duty or modified duty. Uh, so what is the purpose of transitional duty? Again, it's to kind of ease this worker back into the workforce. It gives them the opportunity to do something lighter, physically speaking, as they recover. Um, and again, studies have showed that allowing um, that person to feel productive and active and doing something often can speed up the recovery rate um, without risking a re-injury. So I mentioned studies have shown that there's benefits to both the injured worker and the employer with transitional duty. So now we're going to take a look at what some of those benefits are. Benefits to the injured worker, the first one is that the worker avoids feeling isolated. You are not stuck at home while all your coworkers are being active and uh, socializing with people. It gets, like I said, gets the worker off the couch active and doing something. Um, for instances where the transitional duty is at the employer's job site, it allows them to main, maintain contact with their fellow employees. Again, it boosts the injured worker's morale, helps them to keep the mindset of being part of the team. Um, the employee doesn't feel guilt uh, or have issues with self-esteem about not, not being there or not being a team member or not being helpful um, because they are on the job site, job site. The employee acclimates more quickly to the full duty job. Again, this is supposed to be something that's a transition to get that person back. Um, so if you're going from a light position and you're progressing towards an end goal of getting back to your full duty, um, it's, it's more of a graduated change. It's less stressful physically and emotionally on the worker. Uh, the worker maintains a productive mindset. Um, it sends a message to management that they are committed to uh, their job and in reverse the management is committed to getting this injured worker back. Um, 
Studies show that the odds of returning to full employment drop by 50% after just, excuse me, 12 weeks of being off the job. So obviously that's a huge number um, and, and speaks to the fact that the quicker you can get this person, the injured worker back and active, um, the better the chances are that he or she will return. So we talked about to the employee, now what about the employer? Um, for one, it provides uh, a transition for the injured worker and um, allows the employer to re retain a skilled, knowledgeable, and experienced employee. So um, this is beneficial because if you can transition the injured worker back and you don't have to replace that person, it can reduce what we talked about as one of the indirect costs of hiring and retraining. Um, it gets the employer, I'm sorry, the employee off the couch and uh, back to work. Um, communication is enhanced because the employer is able to see this injured worker face to face on a daily basis. And as the healing process speeds up, the medical expenses drop. Um, again, we can avoid hiring and retraining for replacement. Um, and another statistic I threw in there is the injured employee that's offered modified duty returns to their prior job twice as often as those who aren't and they spend half as many days on sick leave than an injured employee who is not offered transitional duty. So then there's a question, what if the employer cannot accommodate? What if you're in a heavy trade or a small place where you can't make a physical accommodation? One of the benefits of transitional duty is that it doesn't need to be an actual job. Again, there's been studies done on this, um, and really it's the key component of getting that injured worker out of the house and doing something productive and active. Um, so a lot of times, uh, if the employer can't accommodate it, we look to volunteer um, opportunities to get this person involved. Um, you can do, uh, another option is you can do um, specific task assignments. If there's not a full-time position for that person, you can have your supervisor create a wish list of stuff that needs to get done, um, but that he or she doesn't have the time or personnel to complete. Um, and I mentioned this already, but the volunteer opportunities can be coordinated off-site. Um, and one tip we suggest is make sure that uh, anything off-site, you communicate to your employee that it is expected of them, it is mandatory in order for them to receive their benefits, and that their time with these facilities should be viewed by the injured worker as an extension of his or her employment. Some examples I just threw out, we, this has been done through Red Cross, Goodwill, a local shelter. Now I'm going to turn it over to Brad, who's going to talk about something specific to Illinois. Hi everyone, my name is Brad Nell. I'm a principal, equity principal of Nell O'Connor Danowitz. I've been practicing nearly 30 years. And the one thing I found out in those 30 years is that most of my clients, mostly my self-insured clients especially, I found out that they are very concerned about work comp costs because they're assessed against the local plants or offices' operational costs. I hear it all the time, and especially in this challenging state, it really affects the bottom line and the profitability. So the goal when we get involved with an operation is to eliminate or mitigate workers' compensation to protect or to reduce this profit. And not reduce profit, but to protect it and reduce the cost. And how we do this, the most effective tool that I have found in, the, in my 30 years is to have an effective safety risk manager that can implement a viable safety program to prevent workers' comp cases or accidents. And number two, have a viable light duty program to reduce TTD or temporary total disability or to avoid permanent total situations that we commonly face in the state. So to me this is the most effective way to reduce exposure at the plant level and to protect profit. Now in addition I found that another tool in our tool belt is to have a reliable and consistent occupational clinic that can treat workers immediately after the accident. Why? We need to, to one, to have workers 
injured workers to be treated as fast as possible before they have a chance or an opportunity to go to, let's say, a chiropractor or, or other ineffective treaters. We also want to lock in workers into an accurate and truthful medical history. I have found that it's less likely for a person who is truly injured that are in pain to have the opportunity to think about financial gain. And they, have, they don't have the opportunity to talk to their coworkers, their spouse, or even an attorney to manufacture a claim. They are more likely to tell the truth under the duress of pain if they did suffer an accident. So we want to lock them into a history, an accurate medical history, that they, it would be hard for them to change their tune later on. Number two, I think it's vital to reduce over-treatment exposure. Hopefully you can control the initial treatment, chain of referral. Especially in Illinois, you're limited to two chains. You want to control that first chain so they get the proper treatment and if they need a referral from the initial occupational treater, then it's to the right doctor, to a credible doctor that's not going to overtreat and hopefully get the worker back to work as fast as possible. It is in a number three, of course, this is without saying, this is common sense, that getting the workers back to work ASAP, thus reducing TTD payout. It is vital to have a doctor or doctors that is their goal, not to overtreat, not to run up the bill, but to get the injured worker back to work ASAP. Next screen. Change in workers' compensation culture. It is vital, I have found out, especially when I have taken over a plant that has been in disarray a plant that had, did not have an effective workers' compensation program or risk management program. The bottom line is the culture is that the workers control the plant and not the management. And basically, you've got to send a message to change that culture. I think a goal, the goal should be to establish a fair but tough on workers' compensation claims. So I go to Teddy Roosevelt. I'm sort of a history buff. The Teddy Roosevelt approach that I always think of is speak, so speak safely but carry a big stick. Or speak softly but I put safely but carry a big stick. What do I mean by that? I mean on minor injuries that are legit, try to settle them on a pro se basis. That means, of course, try to settle the cases before they get counsel, okay, and be fair. That will send a message that you are fair. However, on fraudulent injuries, that it's clear that fraud is, is, is there, either in the injury itself or in the malingering in the treatment of their injuries, especially in cases where they are alleging that in a permanent total situation, you need to fight, a, a fight to the bitter end to send the message. Another effective, I think, that's essential to effective workers' compensation reduction is to have an effective TPA insurance program. Have a TPA or insurance company that is going to work with you, they know your business, and they are your partner in trying to reduce costs and exposure. Of course, this is my next favorite one, sort of self-serving, I admit. Have effective counsel. You need to have counsel that believes in the team approach. Do they get along? Do they know your business? Do they care about your business and do they know your goals of reducing workers' compensation exposure? The better counsel knows your operation, the better they know you and what your goals are, I think the better you'll have uh, cost control. And I think this is vital too. It's a lot of work. But Nicole had touched upon this earlier. And that is have a quarterly claim review with the plant and the TPA involved. Everyone needs to be involved. Everyone needs to be accountable, including the lawyer. Communication is the key here. Communication is key. Everyone needs to be accountable. It keeps everyone honest. And also, also you can determine if cases are being reduced, if they're being settled in a timely fashion, and 
At the same time, you can brainstorm on certain difficult claims how to resolve them. I feel in person sometimes is far better than emails. Emails, you know, they are great to a certain effect as to communication, but the bottom line is you need to be out in that plant. Everyone who's on that team needs to be there at least, I think, four times a year. Next is the use of surveillance. I think it's appropriate to use surveillance when you have sufficient information. You have to do a media search, but not just a shot in the dark saying, oh, I'm going to put a day surveillance on this person because it's summertime. I believe in order for it to be cost effective and to be effective, period, for litigation purposes, you've got to know if a person is going to be in a certain place, let's say an IME, for example, or you have information on their Facebook or whatever media, and you know they're up to no good. Or you gain information through coworkers. People gossip a lot. Then I think surveillance can be a very effective tool for litigation purposes in which you can resolve claims at a reduced basis. And then also another use of surveillance that's key, and Nicole and I have been able to use surveillance to our IMEs, to our independent medical examiners, because, and even treat your doctors. They don't know what the patient or the petitioner is up to. They are relying upon that worker, that injured worker, of being truthful, and I would say about half of them are not. So it is key to change the mind of a medical provider or a treater and you can do that. What they say is a picture is worth more than a million is more, worth more than a million words, a thousand words. I truly believe that when it comes to surveillance tapes. The next thing I can't emphasize enough is, and I always recommend this to my clients: show up at the industrial commission or whatever commission that you may have in your uh, various states. It sends a message to the arbitrator, to the administrative law judge that you care. It also shows that the injured worker that you're not going to be a pushover, that they're going to have to tell the truth, especially if you're sitting at, at that table looking at them while they're testifying. Also, you can help provide us valuable insight information during the course of trial. I believe it also sends a message back to the workforce that you are going to be involved and that you do care and that you are going to fight fraudulent cases when needs to. And that's all I have for now. And I guess the questions start now. Thanks, Brad. Uh, I'll take it back for just a minute or two. We're coming to the top of the hour. So that was a great presentation. Lots of great information. We saw everybody was really paying attention. Um, so thank you very much, Nicole and Brad. Uh, if you could go to the next slide and perhaps one more after that. I just want to tell the audience real quick how ePay systems can help. Um, on the next slide, you'll see our full set of modules, which makes up our full human capital management solution. And I just want to point out in a couple of the modules how we can assist in the whole workers' comp discussion. First is in our time and labor management. One thing that we do is on our clocks and also on our mobile app, which allows um, employees to clock in and clock out. We have a question, and at the end of the day, the employee can be asked, did you have an accident-free day? And their response is recorded. If the response is no, or uh, no, I did not have an accident-free day, an alert is sent to the manager. So you know immediately that something happened and you can act upon it. It also has the employee record that idea every day, that well, what happened. And that can really help you in some of these cases. Um, another thing, other items that we can assist with is really within our human resources management module within HR. So if there is something that happens, an incident, you can go in and you can track that case. So you have a, a case management system where you can track the case, you can also track uh, OSHA-related cases and generate OSHA 300 reports. Also in our HR system, you can audit your work, workers' comp class codes and get reports. So you can uh, get this audit report on an annual basis or whenever you need it so that you can provide that to your workers' comp insurance. 
And you can get also other types of uh, HR census reports and even ad hoc reports that you might need so that you can look at the, the base, the salary base of a potential employee that's been affected. Also in HR, you can track uh, leave management. So when folks go on leave and you need to really track that, either in your time and attendance tool or up in our uh, leave management tool, you can track that and you can record it in whatever ways you need to. Workers comp time, FMLA time, ADA time. Okay. Finally, in the payroll section, we uh, can track all your workers comp rates and your tables so that the proper taxing uh, can be applied wherever necessary if there's states that do tax that. We also offer an HR hotline so that if you have a question, you can call a specialist right away and get some answers um, immediately. Going on to the next slide, again, I just want to thank you for joining ePay before I turn it back over to Sherry. Well, actually, we will turn it back over to Brad if there are some questions there, but again, Human capital management is what we do. We offer a seamless integrated solution with superior um, flexibility in the tracking of time and rules and also superior tax management. Uh, let's see if we have any quick questions. I know we're really here over time. Uh, Brad and Nicole, I can read those off to you if you'd like. Um, one of them was, if you are in the state of California, but you have employees working in Texas where workers' comp is not required, uh, because you're in California, headquartered there, do you have to have it um, for that Texas employee? Probably. Yes. Uh, I can only answer for, I know in Illinois, there's three jurisdictional factors that determines jurisdiction within Illinois, and I'm, I'm imagining California would be the same. One is place of business, where the accident occurred, and place of hire. So you would have to refer to a California attorney, but I'm sure since their headquarters in California, it would still apply under California law. The, the law. Now, that is not going to prevent them from finding one in Texas and one in California. I deal with that all the time. However, I would imagine that there would be, unfortunately, I know the difference in the laws would lie in California because they're headquartered there. Okay. Well, I'm going to do just one more. Uh, this is an interesting question. Um, the person writes in, we have an employee in California who was texting while walking in the warehouse and tripped on the corner of a pallet because she didn't see it. Would this be an example of no fault? Is the employer liable? Well, do you want to uh, my opinion would be that we would make a defense argument that the injury didn't, at least in Illinois, you're required to establish that the injury occurred in the course of, uh, in arising out of your your employment. So I would argue, um, first of all, I guess I would need to know some more information. The texting. What was the nature of the texting? Right. Was the texting personal? We would have to find out if we could get the actual test that it was personal, that they were texting a friend or a family, not, had nothing to do with the business, then I would say it's personal and not arising out of their employment. Now, if it was in the course of their employment, they were texting, let's say, another coworker or a manager about a work-related issue, then it could be a compensable. I think it comes down to what were they texting at the time. Very interesting. Well, we um, are out of time. Both Brad and Nicole, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you once thank again you for, for having, having us. us. And thank you all of you for spending this hour with us, hour plus. We appreciate your time. And at ePay Systems, we would like to be your human capital management provider. We will be sending out some information where you'll be able to see the slides and uh, uh, also get the information of uh, Brad and Nicole in case you'd like to contact them and get some assistance there. Sherry, I'll turn it back over to you. Great, thanks so much, Michelle, and Nicole and Brad, thank you again for presenting this very informative webcast for us today. Just a few reminders for the attendees. If you would like to view this webcast again, the archive recording and slides will be available for up to seven days. All webcast credits are stored in your hr.com account, 
but do watch for your HR.com email to arrive within one to two business days and it will also contain the certification credit information for you. Your feedback is very important to us, so please do take a few moments to fill out the exit survey that will appear on your screen once the webcast has ended. And this concludes our webcast. Enjoy the rest of your day.